grew up in Kansas City, right on the edge of the suburbs. I could go out through the yard, through the hedge, and then from there on into the woods. And I spent much of my boyhood in those woods with my dog. Those woods, by the way, were my woods. As an eight-year-old, I owned those woods. I didn't have any clue who legally owned them, but they were mine. And I spent some of my best times in those woods and my family's very best times. My father, I remember walking through the woods and I would follow him through the woods in the snow. We watched the tracks of the rabbits and I loved those moments. We became more affluent, moved to a so-called better neighborhood. And my father did no longer had his garden. He no longer went into the woods. His dream was to retire in his late 40s and moved to the Ozarks and fish all day. And he retired in those late 40s and they built a little house on Table Rock Lake. And he basically never left the kitchen table. My father had a mental illness and he became an alcoholic. By then it was kind of too late. Now whether it was cause or effect, I don't know, but in an eight-year-old or a 10-year-old or a 12-year-old, 13-year-old's mind and heart, the less time my father and my family spent in nature, the less healthy we all were. Uh, and I've met people all over North America and now in other countries too, uh, who tell that they did find some sanity, some peace, some connection to something larger when they were in the woods. That both kids and parents would say that something profound is changing in the relationship between children and nature, and they didn't have a name for it. They didn't have a language to talk about that disconnect. So nature deficit disorder is kind of the corny phrase that I came up with, and that phrase now has kind of entered several languages. In terms of the benefits of nature, it seems that almost forever, the people who study child development have ignored the impact of the natural world on child development and human development. Finally, we're starting to get some longitudinal studies. Some of the b best impacts are attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. The symptoms of that, according to the University of Illinois, go down considerably with just a walk through trees in an urban park. Kids as young as five years old, those symptoms go down. The people doing those studies say, you know, they're not saying don't give the kids medications who exhibit these symptoms. They're saying augment that with more time in the woods or more time in nature. Uh, in Last Child in the Woods, though, I ask a different question, which is could it be at least some of the huge increase in the number of kids that are being diagnosed with ADHD and be being given Ritalin and other stimulants for it? might have something to do with the fact that we took nature away from these kids in the first place? Could it be that the, the reason that the fastest growing cohort of people receiving prescriptions for antidepressants are young children might have something to do with the fact that we changed childhood so quickly and evolution doesn't work that fast? There are obviously a lot of other benefits to education. Uh, schools that uh, get their kids outdoors are finding uh, that the kids do better on standardized test scores. There's a big study that was done in Massachusetts of 950 schools. The schools that had woods around them, some kind of green, the kids getting outside the, that school. Those schools, the kids did much better on standardized testing and they factored out all the socioeconomic issues that would throw that study off. Uh, similar study being done in Chicago showing exactly the same thing. It turns out that getting kids outside the classroom or having at least the school surrounded by community garden, by school garden, by a forest next to the school, all of that, uh, those kids do much better on standardized testing and it helps the kids who need it most. The so-called at-risk kids seem to be the ones who gain the most from this. One of the most interesting studies, uh, I, I believe, is one of cities of urban parks and it turns out the urban parks that have the the best benefit for psychological health for human beings are the parks with the most biodiversity and I don't think there's any accident to that I think many of our pathologies as a species have to do with the fact that we're arrogant and we think we can go it alone you know I, I wonder when we talk about social capital why do we only talk about one species 
What about all the, what about the squirrel that just went by here? What about the lizards in the backyard that I look out at as I'm working and they're out there doing push-ups and they make me laugh and that helps my health. That helps my, that's part of my social capital. I never pretend that going out in nature is totally safe. In fact, the risk of going out into nature is part of its attraction. First, let me say that pediatricians don't see a lot of broken bones anymore in kids. What they see are repetitive stress injuries that take a lot longer to heal than the typical broken bone. So kids aren't falling out of a lot of trees lately because a lot of times they're prevented from, by rules from, uh, from climbing them. But the number one reason that kids hurt themselves when they fall out of trees is because they don't have the upper body strength to hold on to the limb. It's like, duh. I have a chapter, I think, in Vitamin N, and the, and the title is, Don't Cut Down the Tree, Build Up the Kid. It's a different way to look at risk. This is an opportunity for the kid to get stronger. And it's an opportunity for all of us to get stronger and smarter and to use our senses. Um, one of the great benefits of going out in the woods is other than the New York subway, when, do you, when else do you use you know, most of your human senses? The people who study, the scientists who study the human senses no longer talk about five senses. They talk conservatively about nine or 10 human senses. And some of the scientists say that we have as many as 30 human senses, most of which we don't use. And some of which atrophy, actually atrophy, some of our spatial senses will actually atrophy if we don't use them for sitting on couches playing video games all day. What I've focused on is actually the habitat of the human heart. And that's where we meet nature. We don't meet it just physically, we meet it here. If the habitat of the heart is destroyed, and it can be, then all our efforts to preserve nature will go with it. You know, we can have all the land trusts we want, but they are still pieces of legal paper that can be changed a couple generations from now. If People don't love nature. And the only way they can love nature is not in the abstract, truly love it. They can like it in the abstract. But to truly love it, uh, they have to have touched it and been touched by it. It has to be a personal experience. It has to enter their heart. And that's what's at stake uh, when we talk about the disconnect of this generation and possibly future generations from the natural world. In my life, nature keeps me sane. And I found something bigger there than my parents and their problems. I was really lucky to have parents that loved nature and loved animals. Uh, but I did find something bigger than their, their problems there. They were in my heart then, and they're in my heart now.